Excellent. Let's go ahead and pivot into the technical demonstration so that we can start to understand how, as organizations are adopting containerization at a rapid rate, what we can do to start securing those modern applications. Because what I often see with my customers that I've been speaking with is that security has lost that traditional role in the modern application world. And when I speak of the traditional role, what I mean in that sense is that prior to containerized applications, anything that got deployed into a production, security had guidance and the ability to enforce their best practices on anything in production. But what we're tending to see with containerized application is that we're pushing this ownership over to developers, but the developers are fo focused in on velocity and time to the customer. So security in this sense is left as an enabler where they can provide gu guidance on what those best practices are, but oftentimes lack the enforcement capabilities. So what is foremost important to understand is what is your assumed risk of your production workloads across your enterprise? Through our Kubernetes health page, we're able to provide unified insights into your security posture across multiple clusters and namespaces so that we can start to assess key configurations or misconfigurations based on what is deployed and live in production. Now, when it comes to assessing overall risk, risk is actually prioritized based on exploitability, confidentiality, integrity and availability of these different configuration settings. So what we need to do is while we're, while we're analyzing the key configuration settings, we need to associate it with risk. How likely is it to be exploited? What are the implications? What would the adversary be able or capable of doing in these, in these key settings? because two of the largest areas of risk in four containerized applications is with misconfigurations. If we think about this, this is because Kubernetes was designed to be up, easy to get up and running. In its nature, privilege escalation is allowed if not configured otherwise. Or think even to networking. Networking is actually designed to be a allow all rule meaning all inbound and outbound connection can be enforced or allowed if there is no networking rule defined. So because it's easy to get up and running, we need to assess these key configurations and ensure we understand where we have risk in our environment. Now, the other key area of, of risk is typically with exploitation of vulnerable images. So we also want to associate these running workloads with their different image vulnerabilities. Now, this is key to understand across your deployments, what type of risk are you going to be exposed to? So in the image repository section, we're able to assess all and scan all different images that you have, associate or align these to different vulnerabilities as well as their fixes. So in this situation, in the example dashboard, we can actually see that we have seven critical vulnerabilities three of which have an associated fix here for security to assess. But what's also key from a security standpoint is understanding that this is associated with a running workload. So this particular workload, even though it has critical vulnerabilities with fixes available, we can see that there is something running live in production, which is high in terms of overall risk and impact as we see here at a level eight. What we will notice is that there is no policy applied in this particular case. Looking at the overview, we can see our general information. You can dig into key packages that are deployed with this image or vulnerabilities and be able to build in exclusions as you see fit. But as we mentioned, this is not associated with a policy at this time. It has a high level of risk associated with it. And so what we tend to see as an additional challenge on top of what has been previously mentioned is that security administrators are new to containers and traditional security practices don't necessarily apply in the same way. So security is looking to different vendors to provide governance and best practices. Now, Kubernetes has actually gone in and defined what is called pod security standards because it was designed to be easy to get up and running and because of the things that I mentioned previously around privilege escalation and networking rules, these default configurations, we understand or Kubernetes understands that this can leave large security holes if not corrected. 
This is why they have three defined policies to start getting off the ground here in terms of adhering to those best practices. So by design, the different standards do allow or do have baseline, which is also associated with basic. This is meant to be easy for adoption. It'll prevent, it'll prevent things like privilege escalation, uh, and it'll be easy to get up and running. Whereas restricted, restricted is our hardening policy. This is designed for more critical applications, which need to be hardened to ensure that they are secured to the best of their uh, ability. Now to apply these policies, natively, Kubernetes does offer pod security policy, uh, an admission controller or PSP. This is, however, being deprecated due to usability issues. Now, those usability issues are including, but not limited to, uh, there are no auditing capabilities. You know, what happens if I want to move from basic to restricted? What impact does that have on my environment? With PSP, you just have to go and enforce it and see what happens from there. It can lead to operational friction. Now, we've also seen, or, or Kubernetes has also seen, that policies can be applied to the wrong workload. There's actually, it is actually designed to be alphabetically resolved. So in cases where the alphabetical resolution does not work, there have been workloads that have been applying a higher privilege level to these assets, leaving overexposure to an organization without them being able to audit and control what policies are being enforced. Administrators have also claimed that Helm charts don't actually ship with built-in pod security policies. So sometimes the people that are applying Helm charts don't actually have the appropriate permissions to apply pod security policies. And with no PSP defined or enabled, pods, uh, PSPs will fail to enforce entirely, leaving you completely exposed from a security perspective. Now, understanding that security is accountable for securing their modern applications, it is a best practice to enforce this guidance. But we want to avoid the pitfalls that we were mentioning previously and the reason that they're deprecating PSPs. So how we do this through the console and through a streamlined workflow is we want to first be able to define a scope. Now, scopes allow administrators to confidently enforce policy on the appropriate assets based on namespace, cluster, cluster group, or even the particular phase of the workload, whether that be build or deploy phases here. This is not alphabetical resolution. We can operate with a higher degree of confidence, understanding where this is going to apply and to which resources we will apply these settings to. Continuing through the pipeline, what happens once we define a particular scope of our assets, we will then be exposed to different rules that we can apply on, on these assets. Now, again, we want to be able to enforce best practices. We want to help with that guidance. And so in our templated policies, we offer not only the baseline or basic rule from K8s, we also offer the restricted policy as well as CIS benchmarks to be able to adhere from a compliance standpoint as well. By applying restricted, what it will then do is it will highlight the key rules that are aligned to the restricted pod security policy. You will then have the ability to either alert or block on each of these key configurations. Now, this does extend into vulnerability identification as well, based on images. It's not just about configuration. It's also how can we enforce based on our overall exposure, what we need to do with our workloads. Applying in both the deploy or build phases, as we can see indicated by the icon here, we can start to mitigate our risk associated with these running workloads. So for example, if you want to ensure that all of your images get scanned, we can block deployments from we can block deployments if they are not scanned or if they are not coming from the appropriate repository. We can also look at this from the build lifecycle and say, okay, if there's an available fix or a high vulnerability here, make sure that this can't get deployed into production because we need to reduce our overall risk. So these rules can also enforce. enforce. We can also add custom rules to get more prescriptive with how we want to actually enforce these different configuration and rule settings. 
Now, one of the things that I mentioned, uh, the reason that PSP is being deprecated is in the inability to actually audit. You just have to enforce. And so what we are doing here is we want to be able through the street, through the same workflow, assess what those key violations would be so that if necessary, we can scope these assets out or we can build in an exclusion for these particular criteria. The key here is that we want to drive operational confidence so that you know what policies are being applied on what workloads. You know what the potential violations and impacts are going to be, and you can operate with confidence that these rules will be adhered to. Because once enforced, this will push down locally and ensure that any, any pod getting deployed into production is now following the security guidance. Now we, may, now we may be saying that this is well and good that we're able to enforce the standard, but if we understand that developers, DevOps is owning the infrastructure here or owning the containers, we also need to integrate with them so they understand early and often so that we're not introducing operational friction. So what we have here to shift left is our CBC CTL tool. Uh, this is our native CLI tool, which can integrate any of violations, alerts, or blocks into your desired CI tool, allowing you to shift security left, notify developers early and often if they're not adhering to this guidance. Now pivoting to our local machine here, what developers will be able to access is CBCTL locally. Now this can be used to validate potential deployments to see if there's any policy violations. It can also be leveraged to scan images locally. So for example, here we will use our local instance and I'm going to go ahead and run CBCTL image scan Java. Now because I did not specify a particular tag nor location, this will be pulling from the Docker repository hub with the tag of latest. Knowing Java, this is going to be a relatively large dump of different vulnerabilities. So while we're going ahead and scanning that instance, I do want to showcase that this is an integration piece as well, noting that CBCTL can be tied into your different image repositories to scan images in line here. So what you are going to notice, we are in Harbor, VMware's open source repository, and we do have CB. Carbon Black set up to automatically scan any images that get pushed into this particular repository. Pivoting back, we will see that we now have our image scan results. As expected, we see a, a plethora of different vulnerabilities noted on Java, both high, medium, critical here. Uh, this will also associate it with any known vulnerability fixes if the developer so chooses to, to apply fixes. But now what's key in, in, in our understanding is being able to assess potential violations, right? Security has said, hey, here is our guidance, here is our best practice. We need you, the developer, to follow that practice. So by using Kate's object validate, what we're doing is we're taking the particular workload we want to deploy and validating it against the deployment policy that this particular instance is a part of. Here we can see that there are several violations, several low instances, as well as a high and medium risk identification or violation on this particular policy. Sitting in the CBC demo policy, you can see where these violations would occur. So now the developer has been able to take this perspective in. Again, let's go ahead and try and deploy this workload to see how this looks from their standpoint as well. So running kubectl apply on this particular workload. We will then go in and see that this instance gets blocked by a Kubernetes policy, saying that this is not allowed based on the policy that's applied to this workload. Switching back to the Carbon Black console, what the security team would have access to are these violations. Moving to Harden and K8 violations, we'll now be able to see the different instances where we attempted to apply, apply that privileged workload YAML file and did receive a block message, ensuring that security has unification of information of what's getting deployed into production, but also the ability to enforce and control what is being deployed and that it is meeting the minimum viable standards to ensure that we are reducing and mitigating risk across your enterprise. So this concludes our container security overview. 
The intention here and what we're designing for is ensuring that we can mitigate risk while introducing no or minimal operational friction so that you and your developers can continue to operate with velocity in mind while adhering to security guidance and best practices. Thank you all for taking the time to watch this demonstration. Please don't hesitate to follow up with questions and have a great day.